this week on Core Talk. Yeah. And there were times in a grocery store in the airport, if you had your core bag on or your or your your shirt, people would ask him, "So you're an engineer, huh?" Right. You know, that, that, then that story had to go different for me. And then, you know, no, I'm not, but it means something. That symbol it resonates. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We're a team of professionals, biologists, engineers, real estate and administrative specialists, lawyers, and many other specialties, all working together to deliver engineering solutions that are vital to securing our nation, energizing our economy, and reducing disaster risks. Safely, on time, and within budget. This is Core Talk, the U Safe's Norfolk District podcast. From harbor port deepening and coastal storm risk management to environmental restoration and research and development, we exist to serve our community because we are a part of it. SAIs. 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 Let us try. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to introduce our first inductee today for the Gallery of Distinguished Employees, Miss Elizabeth G. Waring, affectionately known as Betty Gray. It is my honor to introduce the next inductee to the Gallery of Distinguished Employees, Peter G. Riley. It's my privilege to introduce our next inductee to the Gallery of Distinguished Employees, Ward Chenault. It is with great honor that I stand before you to introduce our inductee for the Gallery of Distinguished Employees, Mrs. Ava Benson. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, it was great honor and admiration I introduce our final inductee to the Gallery of Distinguished Employees, Robert Pretlow. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Core Talk. The title of today's episode is An Induction to Remember, where you'll get a chance to listen to the stories of several of the most recent inductees into the Gallery of Distinguished Employees. Yeah, thanks, James. I know it's been a while since we've done this. Uh, it's probably been over a decade since we've had one of these induction ceremonies, so it's really cool that we had the honor Quite a while. Uh, to induct these individuals. So right now, as you walk into our Waterfield building, uh, on the right side, there's a gallery of distinguished employees. It's got 28 pictures on the wall right now. I think it started back in the 40s. So it's been some time, um, but really it's exemplifying extraordinary individuals that have done great things within the organization. So like, we, like I said earlier, we had that 10-year gap. Um, so we finally found an opportunity to get this thing back into motion. So this year it's a little different. Normally I think we would have one individual, but due to the gap, we're having five individuals inducted this year, which we get to speak with three of those individuals today. So I look forward to the conversation. And each one of these individuals has had a very significant impact on both the culture of, of the Corps and the community in the Hampton Roads area. That being said, I would like to go around and have everybody introduce themselves. Please tell us your names, the positions that you held while you were in USACE, and summarize what your overall experience was. Uh, my name is Pete Riley. Uh, I, I was with UC, with this district actually 35 years. Uh, as far as positions I held, um, I was a mechanical designer for a, quite a number of years. Then I was a mechanical section chief in the design branch. Then I was engineering chief. Then I was construction chief. And then I was engineering and construction deputy. And I retired out of that position here in the district. I'm Ava Benson. Um, I've been here 30, I was here for 33 years. Um, started here as an accounting technician in resource management office and worked there for many, many years in lots of different roles and opportunities. Um, I had an internship program that I applied for and it got me into some other areas within resource management. And through those experiences and, and opportunities, I got an opportunity to apply for and got a division chief position. I started as an accounting tech, then I was a branch chief or than a division chief and so had an opportunity to grow in 33 years to a division chief mission support division by the time I retired and I was in that job about 10 years and um, having worked in resource management was a pretty good foundation for that for that particular job I enjoyed the work um, I knew all the organizations and so the transition to that on a national level which is what the position was dealing with with some of the uh, responsibilities in it was great I'm Betty Gray Waring. Um, I worked for the Norfolk District for 37, almost 37 years. I started right out of college, graduate school, um, as a junior engineer in training. Actually, was the first uh, female engineer here at the district, the first uh, permanent one, anyway. And uh, I started in a rotational position at, under this JET program, J, uh, Junior Engineer in Training. 
And um, I started in the dredging group, dredging management branch, it was called at the time. And I really enjoyed the work. I, I had graduated uh, in water resources management, environmental engineering at University of Florida. And I really loved being on the water. I grew up on the water of Rappahannock River here in Virginia. So it just suited me so well in dredging because it was water-based and a lot of environmental issues as well. So I did that and then went to a few other offices, but I really liked dredging. So when uh, I got a permit position finally in that, that group uh, in about a year, which was the, the norm. So I stayed there actually in dredging management pretty much for my whole career. It changed the name. We did some different uh, work in civil, more civil programs, I think, for a while, other types of work besides dredging. But I ended up actually being the chief of that branch when I retired after um, you know, the 37 years. I think I was a chief for about 11 to 12 years at the end. So that was kind of the started at the bottom and ended up at the top with that group. But it was a wonderful organization here and um, especially that group. I just, I'll have a lot to say later, but it was wonderful. So that seems to be a common theme here. That's what, what, what I'm hearing. And we heard the same thing with Richard Klein, too. You know, yeah. as you were just saying, ma'am, start, starting from the bottom and, more, and moving mm -hmm. your way up. But at the same time, discovering different aspects of your passion along the way within, within your mm -hmm. field. And I don't know, I think that's pretty awesome that engineers or different professionals can come here and find that along the way through a very rewarding but also pretty lengthy career. Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's really cool just to, like, just like you were saying, it's it's cool to see you guys. I think you're you're the second person that I've heard the JET program, which mm -hmm. I don't even know if it still exists anymore. I think Richard Klein did it as well. Yeah, I don't so think it, they do it anymore, but at the time, he and I started just about, he, he, I think he was a little bit before me. But mm -hmm. Okay. I was time. a co-op. I started as a co-op in 79, so that was the other program. We used mm -hmm. to bring people into the district. Okay. And I know we talked a lot about the, the new programs that are out there now, but it's cool to see that, you know, the programs will change over time. But it's mm -hmm. really about how we're bringing in those folks into the organization, letting you learn about how we do business here, mm -hmm. and then watching you climb through the ranks, especially if you're rising stars or superstars. Um, it's really cool to see that growth over time. So, ma'am, which project for you was the most significant for the community, for you, or for both during your time at the Corps? It's a great question, um, could you use the word project? Um, I'm not an engineer. That's not no. the position, you know, to, but what Major von Kaiser was saying a second ago. It is the Corps of Engineers, but there are other opportunities, and obviously it's, it's a business. And so um, when, I, when I got to, I did a lot of good work, I think, in resource management. We had an opportunity to, to find funding and budgetary things, um, all the things that make an organization run. And the, at the end of the day, it's about the money anyway. But when I got the job in Mission Support Division, um, was a little bit broader because it, it was what I considered a ribbon function that threaded through every organization in the district, whether it was logistics or IT or human resources. Um, and at that point, when I first got the job, contracting was even in it. It was later pulled off in and unto itself and to, to my happiness on that one because that's a, that's a big monster and a huge important part of what the, what the core is. But uh, for me, in that human resources was considered a nationalized function at that point as well. And from a project standpoint, business management process was pretty big. When I was here, I will assume it still is now. And every, the term everything is a project, so I didn't have to be an engineer to call it a project. And so for me, what was important was the human resources management or human capital management of the district. I knew it when I was in, in management manpower because we were responsible for getting the labor dollars for the FTE. So when it came to just pure recruiting the best of the best, that's what I had my passion for and took it on as a project. And so we developed a, a human capital management organization, so to speak, representing each, each office in, in the district. And we had challenges and we had dates and all kinds of things that you would in a project. You know, we had a schedule and that, that sort of thing. How long is it going to take to bring a person on board? And so for me, that was the most challenging, but what affected the district the most was getting those folks in the building, getting them here on time. Um, other projects we had is with the nationalized organizations, making sure that we kept them up to where they were supposed to be and, and supervising them when they really weren't ours to supervise. That was a, that was a, a project in and of itself, the negotiations that went along with that. So. Um, 
that was the most significant to me. It wasn't so much the community, but it cer certainly affected the district during my tenure here. No, and it's very, very important. Like, I'll tell you, the human capital meeting is still going on. Absolutely, really. <laughs> um, we're still working with Chira to maintain our goal of 80 days to get an uh, individual hired on board. The R RPA process was something that I got to learn while I was here. Great. It's much different than the Army where they just send you a body and you get a body. Right. Um, here we get the opportunity to pick the best of the best to fit our organizational culture, which right. is great. Um, and it's the, you know, the MSD chief that drives that. Um, you have all the functions that everyone tends to complain about the most in the organization, right? IT is a struggle constantly. Yes. Uh, getting people on board and hired faster yeah. is always a struggle. Yep. Um, so I do appreciate the work that you put into that and the passion and all the great stories that I've heard. This is my first time meeting you. I know yes, I didn't get to meet you last time, right. but I've heard a lot of great stories about mm -hmm. Ava Benson and, oh. and, and the passion that you put into this project, or the passion that you put into your projects my project. to keep the business running. <laughs> awesome. Um, so that's really good. And a lot I of times that. you don't see all, you don't see it because behind the scenes, right? Right. Everyone's out front doing all the projects. That's what gets all the credit. But if the water field build is not running, we, we're not doing anything. That that's what they said. So, Absolutely. So I appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah. That's why I appreciated the project management business process. That was a huge move for the, for the core. At, at writ large, and so w when we took it here, we had great people in every division that understood what that concept was really well. We had courses off off campus, off you know, off sites, and things like that to drill that message home about what it was. And for those of us that weren't engineers, and from my perspective at, at least, we got it. You know, and, and that's that's a big leap from hey, I'm, I'm const engineering and construction, and I'm out in the field, or I'm dredging and I'm doing things with with regulatory and water, other water resources. That what I do as a as an administrative, if you will, prepare professional, it mattered, and and I could treat each thing that I got as a project with a timeline and a task to accomplish it, which was the the baseline, the C O R E, the core of the core. Well, it's great that Ava brought that up about the project management business process because I was going to mention that as well, how important that was really. Uh, it was kind of a game changer here, although we'd been doing it somewhat you know, informally, but making it an actual process here really helped um, keep us on schedule, uh, helped us with our costs. It was, it was just a wonderful um, system, and still is, I know, but one of the things was the project um, management team, the um, project delivery team, I guess we called it. And that was, to me, working as a team <clears throat> was so important because you got to, to know other people, number one, but we supported each other in what we did. We knew what everybody else was doing when they were doing it. So that helped us with our, our work, uh, you know, that much better. It was just a great concept and I always liked working with others in that. You kind of shared responsibility, but you also shared the credit as well. So, but one of the main um, projects that I worked on over the years, and what we were just talking about, it probably has been 40 years now since it's been going on, but was the Norfolk Harbor Deepening Project. Um, the project was to uh, deepen and widen the Norfolk Harbor channels all the way from the Atlantic Ocean down to the southern branch of the Elizabeth River, and it had varying depths um, throughout. The main um, Thimble Shoal Channel, which goes out into the Atlantic, uh, was deepened to is being deepened actually now finally to 55 feet. It, we had some incremental deepening in the 1990s to 50 feet, but it supported the um, initially the coal colliers that were going out needed those depths, but now it's these huge container ships um, that require these large um, depths and widths. That was another thing. Uh, they're getting actually wider as well as deeper and there were safety concerns we know now with this bridge incident <clears throat> recently up in baltimore how important it is for safety to have um, good channel alignments um, i know there's also you know certainly issues with ships but we need to do what we can to make the channels as safe as possible and that was really what the norfolk harbor deepening was all about so I, I worked on that mainly in the environmental part of it initially, because that's what I was doing. I worked with the uh, dredge material placement site out in the ocean, one of the main um, placement sites for the channel. It's a dam neck dredge material management area. And I did all the coordination with EPA and um, some other core documentations to make um, that site certified. and. Um, I also worked on um, some other parts of the, the project, the, uh, some of the technical parts of it.
but it was a, a really interesting project and so important to our our country our you know the economy the economics of uh, the channel um, all the huge ships that are going through now we we're talking about this incident recently with the in Baltimore right. but I think at the time I, mean, I don't know how many million dollars a day if the channel shuts down mm -hmm. it's something like I heard on the radio today it was something like nine million dollars a day uh, if a ship the ships can't go back and forth and of course um, we also have the Navy here and it's so important to have those channels for aircraft carriers and other huge ships that come yep. back and forth I remember when one day we had um, an issue with uh, getting one of the aircraft carriers down into the southern branch to the shipyard and uh, we had to, to do some emergency dredging to get it down there because it had to be there at a certain time there was some things going on and so um, we just really rushed to get that dredging done did a lot of extra work and finally when that carrier went down the river and we could see it here from the office building it was just an incredible mission accomplished kind of feeling when you saw that carrier going down there it was it's so huge and just so important to our country it really gave you a great feeling to have that happen so and <clears throat> in talking about these big projects there's also sm these very small navigation projects um, throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia that we supported and the, the little communities really um, needed these these channels and one of them that I mainly um, think about is the Tangier channels which uh, Tangier is an island out in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay it's a tiny little island I think it's only about 800 people but they depend almost solely uh, for navigation for their um, fuel most of their supplies uh, getting back and forth to you know for medical appointments and so forth everything depends on the boats going back and forth in the, these channels they do have a small little airstrip but it it can't really support much so when those channels uh, are shoaled in and ships can't get back and forth their lives depend upon that so um, we've over the years you know had some emergency dredging at Tangier as well to keep those channels open and that's very satisfying to be able to support you know these small communities and they really appreciate it you know we often get letters and thank yous from these small communities their livelihoods the watermen and so forth um, you know they really depend on these channels so that's very uh, you know a very satisfying part of the job it really is yeah, it sounds like a livelihood that's exactly absolutely it. Where, where the, the it sounds like the most significant impact is obviously there's the economy which you mentioned mm -hmm. and the safety and security but all that kind of still wraps up into the livelihood of the community mm -hmm. it's always nice to see that the district is not just focused on the big projects mm -hmm. right so exactly. obviously those make the big money that supports the bigger economy mm -hmm. but it's really the local communities that we're really targeting mm -hmm. so ensuring that we're helping um, keep all those waterways clear and dredging out whatever needed to do to dredge i think we did the uh uh, Winter Harbor uh, dredging right, support. I worked that was, on that one several times. Yep, so I, I went out there and supported yeah. a survey mission uh, with our folks out there as we're mm -hmm. trying to dredge that back out to uh, move back out to the Chesapeake Bay. We, so. ha we had an interesting um, <clears throat> environmental concern up there. I, I assume it's still there. Tiger beetles, these yep. endangered. I heard um, about those. They little, did not like them. <laughs> they look like little flies, but they were on the beach where we were planning to put the dredge material. Often we um, use dredge material beneficially that's one thing that I really worked on a lot um, and the shorelines were eroding in that area and the material was compatible to the shoreline pretty much fine sand so we were um, studying to put the material there and we found out that it was one of the major places on the East Coast for these tiger beetles that were endangered so we um, worked with some folks from the environmental community uh, and found that this professor at Randolph-Macon College in Ashland was the like national expert on tiger beetles. So we were able to get him under contract and we took him out there and he surveyed uh, the area before we placed the dredge material and you know determined how many tiger beetles were there and then um, after we placed the material we got permission to place it with the environmental agencies because he was working on it really I mean he had the credibility so after we dredged it, um, and we had a time of year restriction as well to make sure we didn't kill any that, that were actually there, we waited until they were burrowing down in the sand, I think in the winter time. 
And so after we placed mat material on the beach uh, from the dredging, he went back out and it was like two or three times as many tiger beetles after we placed it. So we found out that actually dredging <laughs> helped. You know, cool. It was a beneficial um, aspect for these tiger beetles. So um, you know, those are the kind of things that really made you, you know, feel good about what you did because yeah. it actually helped the environment. No, that's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. It kind of always amazes me how much thought and consideration is really put into these projects and how you do them. Like, it's one thing to consider the people who live in the area and, and even another thing to consider the, the migratory pattern of birds in the area, but the tiger beetles. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. Never ceases to amaze. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to hear Ava and, and Betty talk about project management business process, and and I know from being you know the engineer, Ava was talking about you know she's not an engineer. Uh, I happen to be one, but the one thing they did the project management business process did talk about was everything is a project, yep. which meant even the things that Ava did, it, it really broke down the us and them mentality that was not not necessarily here completely, but it really put us all together. We were all working on projects, we were all doing things together. So I think that was really important. It was an interesting aspect of it that wasn't instantly obvious to everyone, but it became obvious as we went along. Um, for, me, for me personally, um, I did a lot of designs. I did about 25 years in design, so I, there's a lot of buildings out there I had some finger in, hopefully still there. Um, so we had that. For me, uh, I was a prospect instructor for the Corps, so I went around the world teaching design build for the Corps, which was literally amazing. Uh, family housing, I ran the, the center of standardization here for quite a number of years for family housing. So there's like basically all of Fort Lee that was redone, new housing was me. I was on it, either in charge of it or right there with the guy I was mentoring to take over as I was leaving. Um, so it's that, but for me, probably the biggest thing is, is Arlington Cemetery. Mm -hmm. The last three years I was here with the district, I was well, I always referred to myself as a civilian half of the program management team. Lieutenant Colonel Fedroff was the military half, and we were joined at the hip. Um, it, it just it worked really well. But for that project, and for the projects there, it was it was amazing. We we did very simple stuff like flagstone replacement, which you would think, well, that's just a dumb thing, but it really isn't. Having that flagstone be exactly right and exactly placed allowed handicapped people to go through. It just made the cemetery look like what it is. And we came in and did a lot of things like that. We got to study the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and we got a bunch of experts in. Um, Dave and I did, it was incredible to do that and see like the cracking in the, in the marble and how is it gonna be, how's it gonna last, what should we do, should we repair it? But probably the, the biggest, most amazing one was the Eternal Flame, replacement of the Eternal Flame. The Eternal Flame, when, when we got the request to do it from the cemetery, was it was the original, still there. It was the last of its kind, and it was starting to fail. It wasn't working really well. It hadn't gone out, um, and they asked us to replace it. So we undertook a huge, what well, became a huge project to replace the Eternal Flame. We were trying to do something simil, s simpler than what's there now. It's actually a compressed air gas mixture that ignites with a series of igniters. But turned out there was no way to do that. So we, we actually made a new version of that same thing the contractor did for us. Uh, we found out a bunch of really cool stuff like we called the, the eternal flame. Well, underneath the eternal flame is something called the eternal drain. And what's really funny is underneath the eternal flame, there's vaults where the controls are. And there was a pump that pumped the water out of the vaults through a pipe. So the project was easy. You know, part of that, we just replaced the pump. Well, it turns out the pipe went nowhere, and we still don't know to this day how that was possible, because where was this water being pumped to? But So after we finished, now there's a pipe that pumps the water down to a drain, but, and, and I guess the coolest part was when we relit the new one, Secretary of the Army was there and relit the new one, and it was just an incredible ceremony, and I, I was just unbelievably lucky to be a part of that. Not all the ceremony, just to even be there to see it. So I think, that I'd have to say Arlington was it, I mean, every day we would go up there it was just incredible whatever we did oh, that's really cool I know uh, well yeah now it's a uh, mr. Dave Fedroff you know still working <laughs> right no, still working right. in the Norfolk <laughs> district uh, doing great things uh, over in the uh, IESPM uh, program manager role um, but yeah Arlington National Cemetery is obviously one of the top things that we're always worried about just as small as an eternal flames like piece 
or you know whatever. We're, I think we're uh, we just put up some pylons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, all those things. We found those during the Millennium Project in yeah. the woods. <laughs> oh really? I mean, you see it when you're there, though. I mean, it's it's a it's a location of national significance. All of those little, I mean, you mentioned them as a, as a small detail, but all of those details together really make that place what it is. What it is, exactly. Yeah, 100%. Shifting gears a little bit, which interpersonal engagements, you know, relationships with either your peers, your community, or stakeholders was most influential for you guys, either personally or for your career? For me, and Pete mentioned it a minute ago, um, it's the interaction with team members and in, in, in your leadership. I was a project instructor as well when I worked in resource management. I was a teaching Butran. And you meet some really cool people along the way, you know, in those courses. They're coming from all over the world and, yeah. and you get an opportunity. They're coming from districts as well. And so the stories that you get to share and talk about what's going on in your district and how do you handle that sort of thing. And so um, it allowed me to meet USACE members from across the world and also make a difference, I guess, and when you talk about the engagement, interpersonal things to me that were most impactful, making a difference, <laughs> at least for me in my career, if I felt like I was contributing at some level, if I knew that something would be better because I, I gave it my, my little piece or my little two cents in. And so um, being part of, when I was Mission Support Division Chief, it, it even elevated more in Butran and Resource Management. I got that and, and we had a community of practice. But once I got the Mission Support Division position, it was a little bit broader, a lot more far reaching. And so working with the executive staff, um, you know, you had senior, the, you know, you got the commander at the desk, you got your DPM. Uh, uh, and all the leadership from the technical, I, I go, I harken back to that, but to have the voice from an administrative standpoint that could influence and th that that part was considered during during development of a project or something going on in the building. That was impactful to me, again, having that opportunity to to share and to give from personal experience and professional input from my team or the teams that I had been a part of or information that I brought from other districts, specifically, was most impactful for me personally. When I got here 33 years ago, everything that, from an organizational standpoint, support, we, and I use the word loosely owned, you know, IT was a part of the USACE team. Logistics was a part of the USACE Norfolk district, I mean, organizationally. They were part of our org chart. They were our, our part of the team. When the core moved to nationalizing functions, that was a huge shift for the commanders and certainly the workforce because we no longer had control of them. You know, we didn't, we, we weren't able to influence even necessarily who they hired for various positions. And so, where well, you might have had your IT chief who had been a part of the organization, understood how things worked, now they belong to somebody else and they're telling you who you're going to get. That was a huge shift. So, IT, uh, logistics, and even human resources. Chara became Big Army long even before the nationalized did. We had our own control. And I, and I use the word control. Understanding what we do locally, I guess, right. is maybe a better way to say that. Because if you work in Big Army and you're sitting at a desk three states away, you don't have the same um, feel for working in the building with us. And so that was, that was a challenge. Uh, Mission Support Division was a new division. We didn't, it hadn't existed before, so putting all those nationalized, let's figure out how to make this work, was, was huge. And it wasn't just me, obviously, it was the entire district, the exec staff, the command and staff, and, and employees trying to make things work, giving input, and bringing in the leaders of those organizations who were, some, in some cases, physically here, and those that were remote in HR, in as part of the group turning that corner to make them part of the group at the table, come to the exec staff meeting, come to the command and staff. Being a part of it kind of address that challenge that I think may still exist across, across the core. If I'm nationalized, so you know I don't have to do what the command does. My boss is sitting in XYZ state in New York or wherever. And bringing them and making them part of the team and introducing that and having them, again, come back to that, we're all in this together kind of state made a difference. And I think, again, it was a new division, so we had an opportunity to try some things. And I, I, was, I was pretty proud of the fact that we ended up having some things that were um, important to the district. We actually, we're the only district, we're not the only. We are one of probably a dozen, I don't know how many it is now, that actually own our building. Yeah, one of it was seven. <clears throat> one of seven now. Um, and so, and there was pressure always on all those core-owned facilities 
to, to give them up, you know, move into what we're doing with every other building that's the uh, core that's renting. Mm -hmm. And we hosted what was what considered the first or the second, I think it was the first here in our region, for all of the um, core owned districts, the logistics managers and the USACE and regional managers here at the district to just have a huge forum about how to make this work and work better and how are we going to remain here because we're almost through paying it. You said earlier that we're finally through <laughs> with the rent, um, that we were paying our, ourselves based on projects to be able to stay here in this building and do the things we needed to do. And the others did that. That was a huge forum. We did that about two years before I retired. And it was, it was seen as something that was a little bit of a change not a little bit, let me retract that. It was a huge change because we hadn't done it. And people were on board for that and under, started to understand what the impact of running a district independent of itself, so to speak, owning it, and being a part of a nationalized organization at the same time, what challenges that presented. So those were impactful things that come to my mind right now that made a difference, somewhat behind the scenes in, in some cases for some, but it was a, it's a great opportunity for me. Yeah, you hit it on the head. Like, one, I'm going to take your idea, and hopefully we can try to put something, some another forum together to <laughs> make them understand, because I know every time they do come visit, mm -hmm. it feels like you're reteaching them mm. some of the complexities of the organization here, but just because we own the building. Right. Um, but I think you hit it. You were spot on. I think it's all about relationship building, mm -hmm. right? So you've, you've built those relationships mm -hmm. with people that are outside our organization, and, and you're helping them understand how the district, district runs. There's 43 districts out there. No district runs the same way. That's right. I think it speaks to, you know, the organization itself, you know, internally. You know, f whether we're talking to somebody who has been in the organization for five years or somebody who started their, their career 45 years ago, there's something that I keep on hearing, and that's, or actually I haven't heard yet an example of when the personnel or the teams did not effectively solve problems through flexibility and adaptability, <laughs> and 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 it's not to say that there there hasn't been a growth process. I mean, because I, I hear that there has been a growth process as well, but that's where the excellence lies in the maintenance of that adaptability and that flexibility and that willingness to say, you know what, this works. Let's move forward and 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 have an impact. Absolutely, it's, it's what you it's, you can share. I mean, it's the sharing of ideas and exchanging of that. Um, people that are in position um, to hear that. Um, can flex and say, you know what, maybe that will be better. Maybe that is the right way to go this time. And so, you're right, the exchange of ideas and being in the same room across the country on the whatever makes a difference. It absolutely does. So that was, for me personally in my career, was impactful. I hope it was. I felt it was. <laughs> it's always hard to follow Ava because she does such a great job describing things as, as she was such a great uh, employee. But um, it is all about relationships. Um, First off, when I first came, I, of course, didn't know very much about the job that I started in. So I had to learn from my coworkers and my supervisors. And they were such great mentors uh, I had over the years. And so I think that's one of the things that's so important um, to, to be able to establish those relationships initially and continue them over the years. And my boss, for instance, you know, he learned from his boss, and so I got, you know, the benefit of what he knew and what his boss knew and what that boss, a person's boss knew. So it, it's since this district has been here for a long time, you've got that history, and you really learn over the, you know, from, um, you know, people many many years ago how to do things, you know, how, how the dredging operations worked and, and what I was doing what could apply to anything, but. Um, not only um, the people, other engineers that I, I learned from, but also people out in the field. We had surveyors. You were talking about going out with the surveyors. Gosh, I learned so much about environmental things from the surveyors because they were out there every day. They knew all the birds. They knew where the wetlands were, the submerged aquatic vegetation because they were, they were on the channels all the time. And they knew a lot of the people. They had interacted. They're out there. They interact with the watermen. They know what the concerns are for the watermen. So that was a really um, important relationship as well, getting to know them and, and get their help on so many things. Um, it was wonderful. Another thing um, that was really important through the years was the establishment of these partnerships, navigation partnerships. The James River Partnership was really the first one. And it kind of came about because 
we didn't have really enough funding to do the complete James River project. It's, I believe, 90 miles from um, Hampton Roads all the way up to Richmond. And there are very shoals along the way, and we n never received enough funding every year to dredge the whole channel. So we were trying to figure out how we were gonna get the, you know, the channel, the shoals dredged, and we kind of learned from the project delivery team that you really have to bring a lot of people in to help you. You can't do everything yourself. So we realized, and my boss, Ronnie Van, was one, I think, that really initiated this, maybe Jim Thomason, who was um, the division chief at the time, that uh, we needed to bring in people from the community that used the channel, the, also the pilots, um, the Maritime Association, all these outside people, all the watermen that use the channel, all the environmental agency representatives, get them all together in a meeting. We had these James River Partnership initially meetings where we all got together. We had speakers um, you know, from the community and from the environmental uh, groups and we talked about what we needed to have done in the channel. How can you help us? How can you help us get funding? How can you help us with the permitting? Some um, other real estate issue maybe we had with the dredging. And so as we all worked together and had these meetings, we were able to solve some of these problems because we worked together. And um, we had congressmen involved. They helped us you know, with some of the funding. And it, it didn't happen right away, but over, it, over several years, we really were able to get enough money in the budget to dredge the, the channel completely and keep it open for a while. And that was such a successful um, uh, partnership that we started initiating with some other projects. We had the Norfolk um, Harbor Summit, a navigational summit, we called it, for the Norfolk Harbor projects. And then finally we did it for the waterway on the coast of Virginia, the eastern, over on the eastern shore. We had eastern shore navigation projects. So that was kind of a, a template for what um, really worked in navigation is to have these partnerships with all the people that were involved in them and uh, work together to come up with a solution and get the project stretched. So that was certainly one of the interpersonal relationships that had a really, you know, success to the mission uh, when I was you know, working here. It was very, very important. You talk about James River Partnership. Uh, we talked about it a little bit with Richard. Yes, uh, he was very involved. Mm -hmm. He was the so project I think manager. we just hit 25 or 26 years of the James Partnership uh, It's about that much, yes, something like that. I think, right. just, I think the 25th or 26th just happened mm -hmm. uh, maybe a month ago. Oh, really? Okay. Um, but we were talking to Richard, and he was saying, like, you know, one day, like, you know, he was just, you know, sitting in his cubicle, and they're like, hey, go get this meeting started with these people, coordinate for them to show up. <laughs> exactly. And now, now you're explaining the importance of how it's like grown over the years and got you yes. all the funding and it helps the collaboration piece. So it was funny just to hear it from his foxhole or his mm -hmm. standpoint of how he kind of like, go make yeah. a meeting. Yep, Roger. Exactly. <laughs> and and I worked with him doing it. it. Yeah, so it was kind of the same thing with me yeah. because uh, yeah, I helped him. He was the project manager, but we worked on the schedule, you know, the. Um, the, the schedules and everything for the, the, the meetings and um, what presenters we're gonna have when, and just kind of got everything pulled together. And, yeah, pioneering yeah. the process. Yes, yeah. the whole process got started, yeah. It was great, yeah. Cool. One of the really cool things about being in the district here, I got to do a whole lot of different things. Um, so I, I'd say impactful things for me were the Army Family Housing Program. We got to, I mean, I got to meet a lot of the actual families who moved into the homes. Uh, probably the most impactful is we did a, a movie for Army about greening of the Army and we interviewed a family with handicapped children and we had built a brand new home that was suited for handicapped children at Fort Lee and they moved into it and they were just, it was incredible to see the real impact of something we had worked so hard to get it done and get it done right and to see that. So that, I'll always remember that and never That's forget. Awesome. That was really amazing. There was the Fort Belvoir Hospital, I was on that on that project for a number of years. Um, and, and that, again, was the first integrated design build, build project the Corps ever did. It, so we actually started construction before the design was complete. It was kind of crazy at the time, but it worked out. And it's like 1.2 million square foot hospital. It's still incredible. I have family members who are military who say they'd rather go there than anywhere else. Um, still, so that's, that's always great to hear. And that was pretty amazing. Uh, the BRAC program was another pretty interesting thing. We actually formed a, like a, a little team here called the BRAC Pack, 
and there was there were guys. The resident officers actually wore shirts with the brack pack on their sh on their <laughs> sleeves, and, and we all worked together as we, we came through that. It was pretty incredible. I think as part of the BRAC program, we created the first billion dollar MATOC the district ever had. And we had a, a series of contractors with a total value of a billion dollars, which is how we got that BRAC program done. We were able to move it. And I, and I guess lastly, impactful for me, I'd have to, Arlington, I can never not say Arlington. Um, you know, I, I walk through the different sections and see some of the <laughs> the gravestones in the same age as my children or my daughters and it's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. unbelievable it, it, we would never it was never enough time to do whatever it is they wanted the executive director at the time Ms. condon was fabulous whatever she needed we tried to do it dave and i did whatever we could to make it happen um and so i, I really want to say dave was really impactful to me in my last few years he taught me a way of uh, presentations that i'd never seen before he's very relaxed and he's and he's very, very believable. And we did a multitude of presentations at all these different organizations and groups in DC and uh, Army Battle Management. I mean, there's just millions of things. I can't even tell you how different presentations. And Dave was incredible, uh, unflappable, very calm, very assured. He kind of taught me that and I've, I've used it in my, my next career as where I am right now. And it, it's just, it's an incredible skill. Dave was really good. And we spent hours and hours and hours together, as you might guess, in the car, sitting on 95. Um, yeah, but five, five hours at a time. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was incredible. So those are just some of the some of the things for me. I, I also want to mention um, uh, when you were talking about Dave uh, Federal, uh, I wanted to mention Mike Darrow, who was also started as a deputy, um, uh, in, in, in now he's the project management chief. But he was the uh, chief of water resources uh, division when I uh, left here, actually, right before I left here. But he um, was such a great mentor to me. He had those Army organization skills that uh, you talk about. Um, he was very, had a strict schedule. He had a way of, you know, kind of um, simplifying things to make them more understandable, but also had, you know, a, like a, a deadline and a, a special way of looking at things that really helped so much. He was just a great mentor uh, to me and to many others. Just a great person as well. Just uh, really enjoyed working with him. One time, there I was. I was at the grocery store in the produce section. And as I was in the produce section, I passed somebody who was wearing a polo and it had the USACE logo on it. And I saw the logo, then looked at their face and tried to see if I recognized them. I didn't. And you know, it's it's something that I didn't think about then, but I wish I did. But I didn't start to really think about what everybody did until I so we started doing this podcast together. And that, I wonder what that person was involved in. I wonder what impact that that person has had on their community. People who also saw this person in the produce section may have even seen the logo. And maybe they wondered, maybe they saw the logo and didn't know what it was. But you can't really find anyone in this building that doesn't impact either their peers or their community some way and that impact is significant. Mm -hmm. Now I say that because I mean I'm also a, a part of this of this organization but when I walk by those plaques the distinguished employees that have that have served in the USA mm -hmm. over time I see some distance in my mind like they are them and I'm me and I'm never going to be at that level. The reason why I'm mentioning that is because when you guys were also beginning your careers here, you guys probably also walked past plaques of distinguished employees and may or maybe didn't think the same thing. So my question is, now that you have been inducted into, mm -hmm. into this list of extraordinary professionals, mm -hmm. what does that make you feel? When you look back at your time, when you think about where you are now, knowing that you've been added to this list, what does that mean to you? You started out sort of saying it had been a gap for many years. When I first got here, obviously it was 33 years ago. I, what year did it start? Do we know that when? It was like 1945 was the first person up there or something like that, I think, and, and to now. And so it was the, it was the wall. I mean, it, it, was, it used to be on this wall mm -hmm. here on the fourth floor just outside the conference room. Um, and it, it was just a wall. Uh, but I'm going to circle back just for a second on the on the, the logo thing because 
um, I didn't know a lot about the Corps of Engineers until I applied here, but I remember after I started working here, who didn't get the, the paraphernalia with the logo on it, right? So you were proud to work here, so you wore it. Yeah. And there were times in a grocery store in the airport, if you had your core bag on or your or your your shirt, people would ask. Well, the first thing they say, "Oh, so you're an engineer, huh?" Right. You know, that, that, then that story had to go different for me. And then, you know, no, I'm not. But uh, but uh, it does. It means something. Even on television, when you watch the news right now, that symbol has it resonates. Um, it has some some history. Some things that were not great over the time for that the core. You know, during tragedies and certain things, uh, like uh, the hurricanes in, in, in um, New Orleans and things like that. But it also has the biggest comeback story for everything after that or during that or what's going on now in Baltimore. So uh, that was a symbol of pride for me when people would ask that. Um, but the wall, to your point, was, in my opinion, when I first, it was just a wall. And uh, just being transparent here, I didn't see anybody initially when I looked at the wall as a 20 five, 28 year old that looked like me on the wall. That was the first thing. But, you know, hey, I, I'd worked at several different, I didn't work for the Navy for a while, in the Air Force for a while, and I was always raised, you just do what you do, do the best you can be, and things will follow. There, there are challenges in any community, challenges in any, any state in, 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 the, in the country, but not to let that hinder you. So the wall was just the wall to me, and I thought, wow, this is, this is pretty, pretty nice. There was one gentleman up there if the name that I knew, actually the employee who is like his great niece or something who, who still works here now, Lindera Dozier Owens. Um, her, I think, it's one of her relatives that's on, on the wall. Um, but there was many years gap before and a many year gap later. And so um, it, it was just a wall. When I got the call from Major Funkhauser, my first thought was, the wall's still up. Yeah. You know, I, wow, that's so cool. And I was, I was humbled and I was honored um, and then I, then I thought about the wall differently, you know. I wondered over the years how many people, may, you know, we all, I love my, the group that we're going in with, but there were some in that gap, or some even during those ones that are up there that maybe should have been on the wall. That, that's just how I think. But um, I'm very grateful, very humbled, and honored to actually be on it because uh, a friend of mine was saying when I was telling her this is, this is you know, this is great, that if my granddaughter <laughs> decided to work for the Corps of Engineers in years to come, become the engineer that her grandfather would like her to be, I'm sure, um, if she, you know, she'd see her grandmother on that wall. So the wall in and of itself is huge. When I, uh, went to, when I went to school, you know, what, what did I expect from my life as in a career and somehow getting to this wall? Um, you know, I, I was raised in a household where my father was a, was a military guy, you know, he's a 25-year vet and EOD. Um, and my mother was a professional. They raised me and my brother to do what you got to do to be the best you can be. And so being in business, I knew I wanted to be in some sort of business. So I did a few years with the Navy, a few years with the Air Force, and then when I got here, um, I was able to apply the skills that I had learned at the other jobs and meet my career goals. And it was college, go to school, get 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 married and have kids, that's standard, you know, American thing. And then um, I wanted to make a difference. And so coming here over those years um, really did make a difference in meeting what my goal was. Never in a bazillion years would I have thought I'd have been on the wall, but I'm, I'm, as I said, humbled and grateful to have done that and been a part of the USACE uh, organization for as long as I was because it met my personal goals of operating like a real business is what I envisioned my career that my life would be contributing at a, at a high level, high operating business. And that unique to the Navy or the Air Force, maybe NAFAC now, I don't know, but unique to other organizations, that symbol meant big business to me, uh, that I could make a difference in that environment, so. It is very humbling um, and a great honor. This, the same uh, I can say about the people on the wall, there, there were no women really on the wall. I think even are probably the first two women to be on that wall, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, because I, mean, I, I worked here for you know, 37 years, and when I first came, I was the first uh, woman engineer, mm -hmm. and I was also the first from, I think the first from UVA, maybe one, there was one other person. Everybody else was from Virginia Tech, or a few from ODU, and so there was a culture here. It was all men from, from Tech, you know, kind of was in charge of everything. 
So here I, I come along, you know, <laughs> totally different than everybody else. And, but I, they didn't make me feel different. I mean, I, I fit in. Um, it was, you know, just a great experience, but I, I certainly never thought I would ever be on that wall. You know, I, I, it was just never something I even considered, but it's just such an incredible honor. And um, I, I knew only one person, I think, on the wall. Um, it was Mr. Pruse, who, um, whose, let's see, son, uh, Roger Pruse, was my boss for uh, quite a few years, and then his um, nephew, Robert Pruse is working here now, so it is kind of a family organization, and uh, that's what's so nice about it. It you know, you have that that interrelationship there with um, people from the past, and I think once you retire, too, you really realize how important the core is in this country. This what, what a great organization is. It's involved in so many important things. Here, just recently with this Baltimore issue, you know, the core has come up. Is, and they're going to be working on a lot of the clearing of the channel up there and some of the other things. But they're so involved in, in Arlington. I mean, how important is that? It's just amazing. So it's just uh, certainly a wonderful organization. I've always been proud to work here and really you know, very humbling to be on that wall. It's wonderful. I'd have to agree with Betty and Eva both. That humbled is the word I have. Uh, uh, definitely. I can tell you when I started, the first time I saw the wall, Eva, it's different. I looked at the wall and I said, man, I wonder what you have to do to get out of that wall. <laughs> you know, but I was a 19-year-old you know, kid at the time, but it was pretty cool. Uh, it, it's been humbling to be selected. I know when the, when the major called me, my first question was, man, it's been 10 years since I retired. I thought I missed it. You know, I didn't think I had a chance. And so it's, it's pretty incredible. I, I, never, I never really worked my career as, with the goal of making the wall or anything. I just tried to like Ava and Betty said, just do the best I could do to help people get stuff done, get projects done, get stuff moving. And that was that was really my whole intent, my whole career. And I guess the, the biggest thing for me about being inducted into the wall was the ceremony itself. Was, I mean, I retired and I had a fabulous ceremony and it was great and I appreciated everything that was said. But at the induction ceremony, my three daughters were able to be there. Mm -hmm and they were not able to be there for my retirement, and they were able to actually hear somebody else talk about their dad and something their dad had done. And Because I know they lived through all this stuff. They lived through the phone calls at Arlington when I, we were talking all you know, like late into the evening or the, the constant drives back and forth, or even the ones to Fort Lee when we were doing all the housing. They were the ones that were always a part of that. They knew. Uh, it's funny, but when we did one of the housing projects, I took my two older daughters with me. They were little, five and six years old, little, and we went up to the groundbreaking, and one of my daughters was looking at the cake. They had a cake there, and the, it was literally a general, I can't remember his name, but a general walked over to her and said, would you like a piece of cake, young lady? And she said, oh, I would. And he went and got her a piece of cake. And I mean, it was just those kind of memories stick in your head, you know, and, but, but honestly, humbled is, is definitely it, to be with some of the people on that wall. I know quite a few of them, actually. Unfortunately, now I guess makes some makes me old, but, um, <laughs> Uh, it's it's humbling. I heard you say just now something that definitely falls in line with both, what both of you said. It falls in line with what Richard Klein said, and that is doing what you can do to help people. And that that definitely was at the heart of each one of your, your guys' stories, which you guys shared with us today. I'm honored to be able to speak to you guys and have you guys share share your stories with us. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for Thank everything. You. Thank you. Everything, sir. Yeah, no, I, one, just, it's awesome to see all of y'all here. Thank you for coming and, and supporting us. Um, you know, we get to finally induct Ava uh, this after, uh, this morning here in a couple, in about 45 minutes. Um, but I think it, just like you were getting at, James, like, I don't think we realize, like, how awesome you guys are. Like, I know that you guys did a lot of great things here, but I didn't get to experience it. I'm only experienced secondhand through employees that are still here. Mm -hmm. So one, it's just really cool to hear your stories. Um, it's that wall is it, it means something, right? It's about greatness in the organization, um, and just like you guys said, like you don't necessarily come here and say, like, "I'm going to that wall." Like I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get to that wall. It's the people like y'all that just continue to do great things here, um, and then people that follow you see that, and this is why we're doing this today. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Our honorees significantly contributed to the district's safe delivery of quality projects on time, 
and within budget while protecting the environment. They did so during the challenging times of the base realignment and closure initiative. And so now it's with great pleasure that we induct Ava Benson, Elizabeth Betty Gray Waring, Pete Riley, Wirt Chenault, and Robert Pretlow as our Norfolk District Distinguished Employees. That's all for this episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Core Talk podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe if you've enjoyed this conversation and found the information to be interesting or useful. Your feedback matters. Remember to comment with any ideas or questions you may have regarding U.S. Army Corps of Engineers projects within your community. Episodes come out the first Wednesday of every month. Until next time.